Okay, so the last day's sessions start with uh, a session on basic bioinformatics. Um, we actually used to have a guy over in the uh, IGBB, which is our genomics and uh, you know biotechnology institute here, um, give this give this session. He's he's now gone on to bigger and better things, and I think probably a much higher paycheck. So uh, Shane Sanders is is uh, sort of the originator of some of these slides, and then. Uh, the, the, so the introductory slides on fast A and sort of the searching, and we've sort of tweaked and modified them since. And so um, the uh, homology modeling stuff is, is new, but hopefully that's, that's uh, useful to you guys as you go into your own, own research settings. And so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on biology review. You know, we've covered this a few times now in this session. So the, the central dogma where DNA you know, is, is used to create RNA, which is, is used to generate or translate into protein. And so we're not going to push that too much. Uh, you guys have seen that before. And, you know, Dr. Johnson gave a really nice introductory session on DNA structure and uh, a little bit about how DNA functions in the cell. And so we don't need to harp on this either. Uh, on the other hand, just as a way of review, remember that we had this situation where a lot of our, our primary structure can be represented by letters, right? And so that makes things a lot easier in terms of, you know, conveying to a computer what a protein or what a nucleic acid sequence is. In this case, with DNA, we can represent them as, you know, A, C, T, and G to represent the, the four bases uh, or the four nucleotides. And we can also do this with the, the 20 different amino acids. And this is one of the reasons why it's important to have those one-letter codes memorized, because you know, sometimes you'll be looking at a file and you'll be seeing a whole bunch of strings of letters. It's super helpful if you can look at those and say, oh, yeah, no, that's, that's alanine, that's threonine, that's tryptophan. And again, as a way of reminder, just remember that by convention, and there's no reason it has to be this way, but by convention, uh, proteins are, are usually represented in terms of the N-terminal end to the C-terminal end. And I mean, uh, nucleic acids are represented in terms of 5 prime to 3 prime. And so sometimes you'll see them differently. But in all the files that we're going to talk about in this morning's session, you'll see strings of letters representing proteins or nucleic acids. And those will represent uh, the end to the C-terminal direction or the uh, 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Okay, so a little bit new, we've, we've touched on this recently, but it, or a little bit over the last couple of days, but generally we would have a way to store sequence information. And, and being able to share sequence data is actually really important, not only if you're communicating with somebody at another institution and you're collaborating with someone else, but also if you're communicating with the computer. Right? And so computers will want to have sequence information or, or data in a particular format. The main one that, that we're going to talk about are these FASTA files. And so sometimes you'll see a file on a, on a Linux server or even on a Windows or Mac that ends with FASTA or maybe even an MFASTA. And those are basically files that just contain sequence data. And they're very easy to look at. Um, you know, we can go back to our PDB. And you know, if you remember, one of the options was to display a FASTA sequence um, for that PDB file. So just as an example, let's go to my favorite PDB file, just because I know it off the top of my head. And so if I go here to display, you can see I can display the FASTA sequence. And all it is is a file with a, a little greater than sign, which sort of has some information about what that sequence is. And then starting on the next line, it just contains the, the protein sequence in one letter codes. And so this would be called a FASTA file. And it's nothing magic. It's, it's actually mostly just a text file with the sequence. But if you hear somebody talking about a FASTA file, this is generally what they're discussing. On the other hand, if somebody talks about an M FASTA, the M just means multiple. And so there might be multiple sequences in that file. And so you might have to look through them and pick out the one that you want. Or if, if you're passing them around to a computer, a computer will be looking for multiple sequences. Some other files that you occasionally see. Uh, and so you know, if you're really into, into doing bioinformatics, remember we looked at the NCBI site. 
And so if I go back to the NCBI database, and let's, let's search for something really simple. So let's do, uh, let's do pyruvate kinase. So clearly something that uh, I, can, I can find tons of information on. And so in this case, instead of going to protein, we're going to go to the gene library. Um, I think that's the right one to use. Oh, no, I, I want to go down here to nucleotide, sorry. So we're going to go nucleotide. And I'm just going to cl click on one of these entries. Again, I can refine this by species or organism, or if I want to search for reference sequences, I can do that. Uh, most of these clearly are not reference sequences, but, but that's OK. We're, we're not interested in that. And so what you're looking at here is if you see here at the top, there's a little drop down that says GenBank. This file format, starting here where the text becomes sort of blocky, this is a GenBank file, right? And so, so a GenBank file contains all of this information. There's a specific format. And you can see that it's, it's defining you know, what the locus, how many base pairs there are, uh, a little bit about what the gene is. You can get a GenBank file for a protein sequence as well. It's the same type of thing, but I figured we'd show it for a, a nucleic acid here. Uh, again, there's sequence of the translated protein in there, but then once you get towards the bottom, notice it's the same kind of sequence information, but it's not a FASTA format anymore, right? FASTA formats do not have numbers, and they don't have this spacing that's here, and the GenBank format generally does. But it's the same type of information, and if you're using a program like BLAST, which we'll talk about a little bit, where you're running maybe BLAST at the command line, you know, a BLAST, will, BLAST program will be able to take a GenBank file directly, and it will be able to parse this out without you having to go in and edit and remove the line numbers and so forth. So that's all a GenBank file is. Uh, FASTQ is, is often used for sort of high-throughput sequencing, where you're, where you're looking at not only the, the nucleic acid sequence, but also the quality of that sequence. And remember yesterday, Dr. Johnson talked a little bit about looking at chromatograms and trying to assess uh, sequence information. Again, that's something that you'll probably do in collaboration with a grad student that you might be working with or maybe your research advisor. But there are numeric codes that are able to assess, oh, this is a very, I'm very confident about this sequence call or I'm not so confident about this sequence call. And, and those can be represented in the file format too. Uh, they're going to have the quality scores in addition to the, uh, the sequence uh, in that file. And so it's, again, just a very convenient way so that you don't have to keep, keep a copy of the chromatogram around, which is you know, graphical and numeric information. And so you know, here's an example of a FASTA file. You know, and again, I guess I'll probably go in a little bit so we can see a little better. Jeez. Sometimes I wonder if the building's falling down around us, but so far so good. Um, OK, so here's an example of a FASTA file. You can see, again, information at the top you know, preceded by a greater than sign, and then the sequence data, which can be on multiple lines. Uh, it doesn't really matter how long this. I mean, you could shove this all in one line. But again, the, the line breaks are there for us so that we can help understand a little bit more. And then the FASTQ format, you know, once again, you can see that there's the sequence data. But then this sort of streams of numeric gobbledygook is something that the computer understands and can apply or assign a quality score towards. And so that brings us to the first type of bioinformatic topic that we want to talk about, which is sequence alignment. And, and, and we've kind of skirted around this for the entire session so far. You know, we've mentioned Google a couple of times and, and how the fact that you can represent sequences in terms of, of strings allows you to do Google-like searches. But Google is actually a really smart algorithm, right? If I search for, for example, um, let's say bicycle on Google, it's actually smart enough to find searches that contain bike as well, right? And so you would expect that there's a lot of chemical information going on in these sequences. Maybe a computer can be smart enough 
to find chemically similar sequences to the one that you're putting in, in addition to ones that just match the letters, you know, simple A to A, B to B, C to C, et cetera. And, and that's true. And so there are algorithms, and again, we're not going to go into the details of those algorithms or how they work, but there are algorithms out there that you can use to do different types of alignment. So if I'm comparing one sequence, my, my sort of query sequence, against either a target database or another sequence that I'm interested in, there are algorithms that can look at those two sequences and compare them based on the chemical similarity either of the nucleic acids or of the uh, protein properties. So again, hydrophobicity, electrostatic charge, um, you know, size. So, so those are methods that are, are actually very, very commonly used in bioinformatics and we have two flavors of, of those methods, and they're both called alignment methods, right? And so the idea is that you would align one sequence against another sequence, and you would try to make those sequences uh, or, or match the chemically similar parts of the sequence, right? And so there's two ways to handle that. There's a global alignment, and then there's a local alignment. I think the simplest to understand is a global alignment, where you're making the hypothesis that both sequences are basically, you know, evolutionarily related. Where if I have sequence A and sequence B, I expect the entirety of that sequence, or, or the first sequence, to be similar or, or chemically related to the entirety of the second sequence. Now there might be little gaps or regions in between where, where the sequences don't match. Uh, but generally, the, the computer, when you tell it to do a global alignment, is going to take the entirety of one sequence and match it up to the entirety of the second sequence. And, you know, if, if there's a huge difference in sizes, or maybe there's a, a, an extra domain uh, in one of the proteins versus the other, or one of the nucleic acid sequences versus the other, then those are basically going to count against you. Uh, now, you can make them count more or less. But clearly, if I have to insert 100 residues between one region of nicely aligning sequence and another region of nicely aligning sequence, that's going to have a penalty when, in these types of algorithms. And we'll get to see that here in a little bit. The other one that you can use, or the other approach that you can use, is called local alignment. And while global alignment is, is sort of the simplest to conceptualize, Local alignment is actually what's mostly done when you're using large database searches. Because the computer software doesn't necessarily know if you're just searching for a domain, or maybe you're even searching for something as small as a small motif. Right? And so local alignment basically makes the assumptions that you know, there might be large regions of sequence on the N terminal and the C terminal end, or on the five prime or on the three prime end if you're using nucleic acids, and those may not match up. It's trying to maximize a, a local region where the region in your, in your query sequence and the region in your target sequence are, are all kind of similar. And then, you know, who cares about the ends? And so that's, that's kind of the differences between the two. Computationally, there's different algorithms for each of these. Um, we can take a look at a, a very simple approach to sort of get a picture of what we're doing, what we're thinking about. And so this would obviously, you know, would this be a protein or a nucleic acid alignment? It'd be, have to be protein, right? And so sometimes you can tell, right? You can say, oh, look, there's an R in this sequence, and so therefore I, I know I'm not trying to align nucleic acids. On the other hand, you know, if I accidentally put a nucleic acid sequence, into a protein alignment tool, it's going to be using the wrong hypotheses, right? Because, you know, proteins like G, C, A, and T, they have one letter codes, but G and C and A and T are going to be very different from a nucleic acid perspective than, you know, glycine, cysteine, alanine, and threonine. And so you've got to sometimes be careful uh, when you're putting in sequences, if you're putting in a nucleic acid sequence, make sure that the program knows that you're telling in a nucleic acid sequence and it's not thinking, oh, this is a protein. Um, but anyway, suppose I have these two sequences. If I want to do a global alignment, now this is almost a Troy or a trivial example, but you can see that the, the global alignment is basically trying to match 
sections from the, the top sequence to sections to the bottom sequence. And in this case, we basically say, okay, this alanine is probably related to the alanine in the first sequence. So Avery is related to the alanine in Garvey. And there's gonna be a gap inserted before that alanine and after that alanine because there's nothing similar. Like I can't say, you know, in this case, um, you know, R is not particularly like V. And how do I know that? Well, again, it's because I have my amino acid properties and my one letter codes memorized. R is arginine, it's a basic amino acid. V is valine, it's a very hydrophobic amino acid. And those two are about as similar as about, you know, anything you can make different, I don't know. I don't have good metaphors these days. But anyway, so, so because these aren't very similar, I'm not gonna try to match up R and V. And instead, my computer algorithm is gonna say, ooh, look, there's a valine right there, and that's actually a perfect match. So I'm just gonna insert a gap here and I'm gonna align V and E together. And once again, R and Y are not very similar. What residue is Y? Tyrosine, you can speak up, it's, it's fine. Um, that's fine if you're wrong too, right? I mean, science is, you know, oftentimes in science you are wrong. You do the wrong experiment, you get the, wrong, the, the result that you don't expect. Uh, sometimes you mix the reagents wrong and you just get the wrong result. But, uh, but it's okay to be wrong, too. Um, but anyway, so, so arginine and tyrosine, again, arginine is very basic, positively charged at neutral pH. Uh, tyrosine is, you know, has basically a phenol ring with an al alcohol on the end of it. So, so, you know, not charged at all, a, a substantial amount of hydrophobic surface area. And so, again, the algorithm would look at this and say, well, I would much rather line up Y and Y even if it means putting a gap in that first sequence. And therefore, this would be how it would do the alignment. Now again, there's lots of ways to do this. There's lots of computer programs to do this. Uh, you don't want to be sitting here trying to make those, those calls. And so because of this, we can, we can go to the, um, we can go to this uh, European Molecular Biology Institute, uh, EMBL, or I'm sorry, EBI, and they have a whole bunch of these tools already implemented online. Now, your lab, if you have a Linux server, I think we have ours. We have it on ours. I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but you can also get command line versions of these tools that will work on Linux. Uh, but in this case, we're just going to look at the web interface, and so I'm going to copy this. And so it's a very simple sequence. You can put in uh, two different sequences, uh, a top sequence and a bottom sequence, and you can compare them directly using the global alignment algorithm. Now this can be really, really useful. So for example, in, in Dr. Johnson's session, he talked a little bit about site-directed mutagenesis. One way to check site-directed mutagenesis is to go through the sequence that you started with and the sequence that you want and residue by residue compare them and say, oh yeah, no, those are similar or those are different. Another way would be to do a global alignment and let the computer do the work for you and it will be much, much less likely, actually it's not gonna do this at all, to, to miss or skip uh, a residue that looks simple or similar. Like, you know, you might be looking at an N versus an M and you might just, in scanning through the sequence, miss the fact that they might be different. A computer is not gonna, be able, not gonna do that because a computer doesn't make those kinds of mistakes. They can do other problems. But anyway, so, so why, while we're here, why don't we go up to the Biochemistry Bootcamp website, and we're going to be working with a couple of different sequences here today. And so that way we can, um, you guys can have access to them. And so if you click here on uh, the sequence list for this session, we have, so this would be an M fast A file, multiple fast A's. And so we can check. You know, this is two proteins that Dr. Johnson studies. Well, he studies calmodulin generally. But we can use this and see what, what, how these things compare. And so our first sequence is going to be calmodulin. We don't need this line, but it can take it. So, so if, you, if you forget to put this line in or you don't have that line, that's fine. So I'll paste both sequences in there. And I'm going to be doing a sequence comparison of calmodulin from humans to calmodulin from the nematode worm. 
So, and then you know it can you can have some options for output format. If you click more options, you can see different uh, features here. Now, for example, we talked about the penalty of opening up a gap, right? And so you can adjust this. These don't have units. These are actually quite arbitrary, and they're basically put in for um, some some basic general you know good principles that that give people good results for most applications. But if you find that you're getting too many gaps in your sequence, you can make the gap opening penalty larger, you know, even up to 100. Uh, you can make the gap extension penalty smaller, and so this is the, the penalty for taking a gap of size one and making it into two or three or four. So usually you don't want to, once you introduce a gap, it's usually okay to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, you can also have end gap penalties for gaps on the ends. So if there's a big section of sequence on one end versus the other, uh, and so maybe the first 10 residues don't match at all and you don't really want to penalize that, you can also turn that off and that's generally the default. And then if you do have that, you can turn it on or turn it off to, to work it out. Now, one of the questions that I often get is, what's the best matrix to use? And so this would be a more this would be better suited to a bioinformatics class, but basically the the blossom matrices um, you can also see PAM matrices in here somewhere, and I think if I click on this you'll see both. Yeah, there's PAMs and then there's blossoms, and so the blossom matrices are basically a, a similarity score of amino acids, and so all of this is based in sort of the theory of evolution and evolutionary divergence, where you know, the blo blossom matrices are basically looking at similar proteins and they're saying, okay, if I have two proteins that I know to be homologous or evolutionary related, and I align their sequences, how frequently does serine, for example, swap to threonine? And if you see those, those swaps frequently, well, then that's telling you something about the evolutionary relatedness of serine and threonine. It also tells you something about the chemical similarity of serine and threonine, right? Because serine and threonine are both small, uh, nice hydrophilic amino acids with an alcohol group that's able to participate in hydrogen bonds. And so, so typically, blossom matrices are, are giving you something about chemical similarity of uh, different amino acids. PAM, the, the point-adjusted mutation, and they're called blossom because they're aligning blocks. So the blocks are BLO. PAM stands for point-adjusted mutations, and this is, this is based on other evolutionary hypotheses where you would say, okay, how, many, how, you know, how likely would I expect this serine to be mutated to this threonine if I have 10 million years of evolution, 20 million, 170 million years of evolution. And so that's, it's based on a slightly different set of hypotheses. Uh, it turns out that the blossoms typically work a little bit better because they're, they're more practical. They're based on, on actual alignments rather than some hypotheses about mutage mutagenesis rates. But you can go in and apply both of them. Uh, the blossom matrix that, that's given here, blossom 62, again, probably suitable for 99.99% of what you would want to do in a uh, normal sort of circumstance. Okay. Okay, everybody. <laughs> I apologize for the technical difficulties, but uh, we'll, be, we'll be back up and running, um, at least for this session, and hopefully they'll, they'll be able to figure out what's going on with the projector. Um, I'm also hopeful that they don't like just shut power to the entire room or something crazy like that. Um, anyway, so we were, before we were so rudely interrupted by the fact that the projector shut off, um, we were working on sequence alignment. And so we were doing sequence alignment of, of two variants of uh, calmodulin. And so the um, first variant was from, from uh, human, second variant was from nematode, and we talked about all the different options you can set. And so the, the final thing that we can do is basically go down here and submit. And for most of these, again, I apologize, this is going to be a little small, uh, especially for you, those, those of you in the back. But we are, again, getting this on video. Um, and so you know, this will take a, a second or two, but for a, a sequence alignment project that's this simple, 
it's not going to be super long. So again, here I've, I've gone in and edited it to, to change it so it's human and nematode. This is what you'll see uh, once it comes up. And I'll check it here every couple of seconds just to see if maybe it comes up. And just to make it a little bit bigger, I guess I'll, uh, there we go. OK. So what you'll see here is you'll see the global alignment. And it will show up where the upper sequence is the sequence one that you've put in. The lower sequence is the lower sequence that you've put in. And it'll draw a little line between all the, sequen or all the amino acids that are identical. And it'll draw like a dot or a colon based on the similarity scores of the non-identical amino acids. And so again, if you were doing site-directed mutagenesis, what you would look for is you would look for sections that don't have a straight line between the upper and the lower residue. And in, key, in this case, the only residues that differ uh, between the nematode and human, calmodulin, is this residue here. So you can see I go from Q to I here near the end, and then A to T also near the end. And so those residues are pretty darn, you know, given how different we are from, from nematode worms, those residues are pretty different. And we will see that they are, um, you know, that, that, you know, even though there's, there's lots of differences between uh, us and, and a worm, um, at least calmodulin is highly similar, right? And so that's the kind of thing you can do with this global sequence alignment. Uh, you can use this to, to do a, a, uh, a lining of sequences. There's also programs out there that we're not going to talk about too much, but you might, you might encounter uh, using multiple sequence alignment. And so those would be, um, you know, things like Clustal W, or you can use the MEGA program uh, to basically do comparisons of many, many sequences at the same time. And so the idea here is that, you know, maybe I have, um, you know, calmodulin from nematode, calmodulin from human, calmodulin from rabbit, calmodulin from some kind of fungus. You know, the reason I chose nematode is because if I use rabbit, chicken, hum uh, you know, horse, cow, all the traditional mammalian uh, counterparts, those calmodulins are like identical. They don't differ by a single residue. Whereas, you know, here if we go to nematode, we finally see that their sequence similarity is 98 point, or 98%, and their sequence, or sequence similarity is 98.7%, and their sequence identity is 98.0%. Um, Sometimes you'll hear people talk about, you know, oh, these, are, these proteins are 98% homologous. Don't do that. Um, again, I don't, you know, in a room this size, probably very few of you have had a, a class on evolutionary biology, but homology is a, is a hypothesis. So two proteins are either homologous or they're not homologous. There's not a percent homology. Most of the time when people are saying these two proteins are, you know, 78% homologous, what they really mean is that the amino acids in an alignment are 70% or 78% similar or, you know, 84% identical, right? And so, so you can say that those proteins are or are not homologous, but the percentage is reserved for things like sequence similarity, sequence identity. And sequence similarity, if you're wondering, is, is based on you know, those PAM or those Blossom matrices where they're saying, yes, these two amino acids are similar, or no, they're not. Again, on a matter of time, we're not going to go through and do multiple sequence alignment. But you can go into these websites and multiple sequence alignment, if you've ever looked at these sort of really interesting evolutionary trees, where they talk about relatedness between different types of species, and they make hypotheses about where those species might have diverged, you know, those are basically constructed from multiple sequence alignments. And there's lots of questions in making these, right? These aren't, again, these are models. They're not perfect. And so you might have to ask yourself, well, what protein should I use when doing multiple sequence alignments? Or um, you know, do I want to use a protein at all? A lot of these structures are actually generated based on uh, the sequence of the ribosome, which is about as universal to life as you can get. And so choosing the right proteins, choosing the right nucleic acids to make a multiple sequence alignment here is, is not so, so easy or straightforward all the time. 
And so, you know, why might you want to do this? Well, you know, you might want to do it to determine functional similarity. If we have some time, we'll use this at the end to, to find a novel, um, novel enzyme that, and then try to model what its structure should be. Uh, and so you might be looking for similar enzymes to the enzyme that you're studying to see if there's any differences. Um, people are actually doing some really interesting research right now where they're actually using some of these evolutionary hypotheses and going back in time and generating, for example, a calmodulin that might have existed on Earth you know, a billion years ago and say, oh, let's, let's see how similar, how, 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 how similar is the function you know, is there differences that we can look at? And this would be called ancestral gene reconstruction. Again, it's not a perfect field. There's a lot of hypotheses and, and assumptions going into these calculations. But it's something where you can start saying, oh, I wonder, I wonder what this gene looked like in a, in a much simpler organism that, that we might not actually have on Earth anymore. And so, you know, obviously there's other practical things I, I mentioned about the uh, point mutations. And so you can talk about point mutations and use it to identify uh, point mutations. You can look to see if there's, you know, if you've had an insertion or some kind of uh, other simple change in your sequence that you're working on in the lab. Uh, you can look to see if anybody has identified a similar or characterized a similar sequence. And so, again, we're, because we, we lost a little bit of time, we can actually go in and, and look at the PDB and search it by sequence. And so if you don't necessarily know the sequence, you can search the, P, or the structure, you can search the PDB based on sequence, and it'll find, up, find structures that are similar to the one that you put in based on the sequence that you entered. And so the, the foundation of this type of searching is a program called BLAST. And BLAST has been around for, for several decades at this point. It stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Uh, it's obviously matured over, the, over that time. But it's, it's the tool that we would use to assess whether one protein is similar to another on a very large scale. Right? The, the algorithm that we just showed you, uh, emboss needle, uh, sta the needle stands for needleman Wunsch, which is the name of the algorithm that they're using to do those comparisons. As you could tell, it takes a few seconds for it to do that, you know, even if you're just running it locally on your machine. And that would be extremely inefficient to try to search one, one sequence across a database of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of sequences. And so the, the tool that's out there that people use is called BLAST. It's very fast. It's very efficient. As you can see in the name, it's a local search or a local alignment. So it's not trying to do global alignments at all. And it's what, it's what we're going to study or look at for the rest of this sort of session. And so there's different flavors or types of BLAST. I, I think flavors is probably the best way to describe them based on the type of sequence that you're searching. Right? And so obviously if I'm searching a nucleotide database, there's different ways to search it. And if you think about that, there, you can come up with some of these on your own. Like you know, if I have a nucleotide sequence and I want to search a nucleotide database, well, that's pretty easy. But oftentimes, proteins are based on amino acids, and amino acids have a lot more chemical information than just bases in a nucleotide sequence. And so I could translate those nucleotides that, I'm, that I have in my search query, and I could search them against a protein sequence. And so there's a special name for that. It's a TBLASTN where I translate my sequence and then search against the, the protein sequence. And there's all sorts of combinations of these. Right? So I can look at a protein sequence in a protein data bank. I can look at a protein where I've gone back and sort of reverse transcribed it and made it into nucleotides and use that to search a nucleotide database. And so that's basically what all of these are. Most of the time that you will be using BLAST, you'll be using BLAST-P, which is a protein query against a protein database. And that's the kind of standard one. That gives you the most sort of chemical identity because you know, proteins have all those different amino acids and we can search based on the chemical properties of those. But the other ones are listed here just in case you're curious. The BLAST main page looks very similar or, or looks fairly similar to this. It might have changed a little bit because they updated every couple of days. But you can see that you can select, you know, down here you can select nucleotide BLAST if you're searching a nucleotide sequence against a nucleotide library. Protein blast is the other big one. 
And then they have some blast X and T blast N for the other smaller queries that you might look at. When you click on one of these, again, you get a page that looks similar to this. And, and this is still true today, right? So, so I think, actually, I think I updated this slide. But, but you know, two years ago, this, this image looked extremely similar to what we're seeing now. And so if I search here and go to the Blast web page, You can see I can go to Protein Blast, and it looks you know, fairly uniform. There's a section where you can paste your sequence. There's a section where you can select what database that you want. And again, the, the database that most often you'll choose is non-redundant protein sequences. Again, you don't want to search a database with 15 copies of the same, same sequence in there. And so choosing the non-redundant database means that you'll only get unique hits out. But you can drop down that and you can search for reference sequences. So again, there's that ref seek coming in. You can go in and search uh, the PDB, right? So, so the PDB has its own BLAST search on the website itself. But you can go to the BLAST website and search the databases or the, the protein sequences in the protein data bank. So there's all these options here that you can go in. Again, most often you'll just be using the non-redundant uh, library. You can select which algorithm you want to go. And again, most of the time, you'll just be using BLAST-P. And if we do this, so again, I think if I go here, let's, um, let's jump ahead a little bit. And so we're going to need this for, um, for our homology modeling discussion. And so just a quick preview, we're going to take a sequence of PIN1, which is a protein that we looked at yesterday, and we're going to try to find uh, a hom hom homologous sequence, uh, and we're going to look for a, 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 a cyanobacterium. I think it's a, it's a bacterium that likes to live on methane. And so we're going to try to uh, find that sequence using BLAST. Right? And so in the list of sequences that you have, the unknown sequence 1, that's a nucleotide sequence that you can put into nucleotide BLAST, and it'll show you what the, what the protein is. So again, you might not know what that sequence is, but BLAST can tell you. But this is PIN1. This is the sequence. We looked at the structure a little bit yesterday. And we'll do protein. We'll, use, we'll put that into our query. And in this case, we want to look for a very specific organism, this uh, methanocorpusculum libreum. Does anybody remember from the first day what the, um, what the organism uh, search, search keyword is for NCBI databases? ORGN. So I could do this in here. I can just paste the organism. Or I could also go down here to algorithm parameters. There used to be a a way that I could filter it based on searches. They might have taken that out because it did slow things down quite a bit. Anyway, I can just go in here and paste this into the organism, and you'll see that it shows up. And so now I'm searching for sequences similar to pin 1 in this very simple, uh, I, I don't even know, I think this is archaea, so it's not even a bacterium. Uh, but, I, but anyway, uh, I'm not a bacteriologist, so full disclosure there. But I think this is an organism that, that lives on, on methane or thrives on methane. And I can just go down and hit blast. Again, this will take a few seconds. Um, and so again, don't expect instantaneous results, but it will be similar to what we saw before, where the website will continuously update uh, while you're going through. And you know, it'll say, OK, uh, it will update quickly at first. And then if it's taking some time, it will update you know, every 30 seconds or so. Let's let that run the, oh, no, it's done. Sweet. Look at that. So it found one. And so pin one is a proloisomerase. It found one proloisomerase in this, in this organism. If I click on the result, it takes me to a sequence alignment. And this, this protein is not at all similar, right? If I'm looking here, there are 42% identities, 54% positives. But it's nowhere near the level that we saw for calmodulin, 
right? And so thinking about what the structure of this protein might be compared to the pin one from a human, you know, it's probably going to be, well, it's probably going to be similar, but there might be some significant differences here. Certainly, I don't think that you could find this in the PDB. So we're not going to be able to go to the protein data bank and find the structure of this. OK, so, so now that that's run, let's take a look at some more stuff on BLAST. So if I go to the other BLAST sites, like TBLASTN, BLASTX, et cetera, nucleotide BLAST, you know, it, they all look the same. They're all going to have a similar format. Give me a query sequence. You can select some organisms. And then you can select, you know, you can also go in and select your matrix there, too, if you want. So they're all going to be very same, very similar. If you want to go back and do something fun, you can put this in yourself, but we're not going to do that. Uh, it turns out that when you search for that, you get you know, a lot more hits than what we just got for, for this very obscure uh, bacterium. And so looking at your BLAST results, generally what you want to look at is your bit score, right? And so the the you know, bit score is telling you, you know, essentially what's the likelihood that you would find that match at random. And so if you have a 30, that means that you would have to search about, you know, a billion independent segment pairs to find something that matches as well at random. And so the larger your bit score is, the more likely that you are going to have a, a good, good match. And if we look, Back here at our result, we can see what the bit score is. So 79.3. And so that means that this is probably pretty significant. Um, you know, two to the, I don't know what 2 to the 79.3. But the complement to the bit score is the expectation value. And the lower that is, the lower it is, lo the lower the likelihood is that you're going to expect to see that by chance. And so this is probably a significant match. You can ins install this locally. Uh, again, I think my computers at, at already have it. So if you type BLAST on the Linux, you can, you can bring it up. But you know, so far, we've only looked at sequence alignments. There's also algorithms to do this by structure. And one might argue that since structure is what's really most important in doing chemistry, maybe structure is the best way to do alignment. Uh, the the pro program out there that does this is called VAST, or the Vector Alignment Search Tool. Uh, again, we're not going to go into this, uh, you know, I don't even do this on a normal lecture, but now that you know it, you basically can upload a PDB file and it will look for uh, similar structural, tertiary structural motifs. And so what we're moving towards, right, we've done sequence alignment, what we're moving towards is this way to do homology modeling. And so the hypothesis here, or the, the scenario here would be, let's suppose I have uh, a protein structure that I know, I have a sequence that's similar, but it has a structure that I don't know. Is there any way to use the known structure or maybe structures to generate an approximation or, a, or an estimation of what the structure would be for the sequence where I don't know the structure? And so that process is called homology. Homology modeling, it's based on the fact that proteins with similar sequences tends to have similar structures. Now there's a limit to this, right? And so, and this is in every bioinformatics textbook that you could open. Uh, this is the original data, and the data is a little bit hard to say, or hard to interpret unless you've thought about this for a while. But basically what it's showing you is that, you know, up to a certain point, if you have a large amount of sequence identity, so 35%, 30%, um, you know, up to a certain point, the, the likelihood that they're going to be real positives is going to be pretty high. But then once you get below 30% sequence identity, the likelihood that those two proteins are actually going to be homologous and have similar structures starts going down. And that's basically what these two curves are, are telling you. And so if you're looking at sequence identity in a BLAST search or in a Needleman Wunsch uh, or an emboss needle query, you're going to say, oh, look, I see 40%. The likelihood that those proteins are, are truly homologous and have similar structures is actually pretty good. On the other hand, if you see 20%, well, it may or may not be 
uh, homologous. And that's, that's often called the, the twilight zone or, or the uncertainty region. And so that's where you would say, well, I probably can't do really well down here. or It might be hit or miss. But above that, you can do it. And so homology modeling is a situation where you can go in and find proteins with similar sequence whose structures are known and calculate an estimate of the structure yourself. And that's super useful because if you're tasked with you know, understanding a protein and you say, hey, make some mutations to the active site, well, you might not even know what the active site is. But you could generate a homology model and get a pretty good estimate on what those active site residues might be and start making changes and use the homology model as a way to generate hypotheses about what sequences to change. And so there's lots of different programs out here. We're going to do the most time on a program called Swiss Model. It's by far the simplest out there. Um, and it's also the most likely to get it wrong. Uh, and so you, pay, you get what you pay for. I mean, all of these are free. But this is the one that we can actually get done in the span of this, this uh, session. And so if we go back to our sequences, you'll notice that this is the sequence that we got out of the BLAST search. Right? So you can either copy it directly from, from the BLAST search that we just got. Right? If you look here, this starts MVRK, uh, MVRVK. If I look over here, you know, MVRVK. So there, the M is gone, but, but it's giving you that sequence. And so this is the sequence that we found from this oddball bacterium. And this is the sequence without any dashes and whatnot that I, that I constructed just for the simplicity of this session. And we're going to go to Swiss model. So you can either click on the link or just Google it. And we'll just hit start. It's, it's really simple. And so this is where I would say go first. Because even though it's not the best homology modeling program out there, it's by far the simplest to use. And it's the one that gives you the results the same day. OK, so you can go in here. If you know that there's things like heteroatoms, so suppose you're looking at a cytochrome where it has a heme or some kind of um, you know, prosthetic group that's in that protein, you can tell it, hey, look, I know that there's a, there's a heteroatom or a prosthetic group that you should probably be accounting for. You think you can also go in, if you know cysteines that are, that are cross-linked, you can put those in too. We don't have any of that here. And generally speaking, you don't know those things, so you wouldn't put them in. And you can either do two things. So this is like the build model is sort of like Google's I'm feeling lucky button, where it's just going to get you the original, you know, the best thing that it finds right off the cuff. You can also go in here and search for templates, uh, which will, again, go through and try to find similar sequences where the structures are known. And you can select, oh, yeah, use this, 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 and this as a way of gen or as, as the basis for generating my new structure. And so we'll hit search for templates first. Again, this might take a few seconds. You get to this nice, pretty screen where it's, it's cranking away. And while it's cranking, we're going to press on. So there's other models out there. So Fire2 uh, is, is another homology modeling software. Similar type of thing. You give it a sequence. The difference is that this takes a couple of hours to come back with. And that's because it's using additional sort of molecular modeling information. And it's potentially doing a more exhaustive ser sequence search to look for similar structures. And, and using that to generate your, your results. The third one that we can talk about is ITASER. And this one is the best, sort of, or, or it's usually the most robust means of generating a homology model. But it's also going to take the longest. And so we could put a couple in here, and it might take a few days to get back to us. Here's where you'll, you'll uh, put in your email address, and it'll send you an email. But if you're going home on a Friday, you know, you can start a homology model and it'll be done. You know, that's the great thing about computers. Uh, they don't mind working the weekend. So you can just tell them to do it over the weekend and you'll hopefully get a result, uh, you know, the next week or early the next week. 
And so again, we've already done this, so we can save ourselves a little bit of time. And so we've searched for the uh, homology modeling result for you know, pin one against other uh, sort of oddball organisms. And then this is what our result would look like under Swiss model. And, and I'm not sure if it's done yet, but we can go back and take a look. It should look very similar to this. In this case, what's going to happen is it found essentially one protein that it's going to use as a template. And that's always a little bit sketchy. You always like it to find, um, you know, find good templates. If you can find many templates, it's more likely to build something that's, that's a little bit more consistent across those templates. On the other hand, if you didn't know that this protein was in the PDB and it finds an exact match and gives you that structure, you really only need one template. So, but it's basically showing you the model that's, that it's generated from that template. You can go in here, there's, there's assessments of the scores, sort of the higher the scores, the better. Uh, and so this is telling you the overall score, but then it also gives you the sequence score. And on the next slide, I have sort of a picture of what that is. And so it's giving you an estimate of the local quality. And you know, in this case, overall, it's, it's pretty decent local quality. You know, there's not a particular region that drops down significantly. If there were, you would say, OK, well, I might have to ignore that loop or maybe, maybe you know, use some significant uh, caution when trying to interpret structures in that particular loop. You can download the structure and view it in PyMol. So, you know, very easy to do. And let's go take a look. Yeah, so it's done. Oh, look, here it found several templates. Cool. So, so it found all those templates. We can go in and we can select as many as we want. So, yep. So again, I'm going to use the top three uh, and I'll build models based on those templates. And so that's, so again, if we had just clicked, you know, build model from the front screen, it would have just picked the top one and build the template from that. But here you can see, you know, it's built me three structures. Looking at these, they all look roughly the same. They all have roughly the, the same score. Although I think this one is the one that it's, it's thinking is the best. And so I can click on structure assessment. It'll show me the Ramachandran plot of that model, so there's nothing really outlying. It shows me this information on you know, the local quality again. And digging around, you can download the project data, which will include the PDB file of this. So again, if you don't have the structure of this particular weird uh, prolo isomerase, you can use this to generate hypotheses about which regions might be the active site, or which we might want to make mutations in to make the protein more soluble, or something along those lines. OK, so the other two, again, we can't cover in class. But I've downloaded them. And in the interest of time, we're not going to explore them. But you can go look at the summaries. And, and I've basically taken the downloaded result from running this, uh, the homology model on Fire 2 and Tasser, And I've basically put them on my website that you can go explore and you can look up, see what the results would look like. It's the exact same files that if you were to run it, wait a couple days, you would be able to look at it from there. And so you can just click on those links. But then what's cool is that once we've done this for three different homology modeling programs, we can actually open them up in PyMol and compare them. And so, so I've gone in here. I've given you the original PDBs on the Biochemistry Bootcamp website. And so if you want to practice PyMol, you can go back and you can type, you know, you can read in all of these proteins into PyMol and practice using that align command that we talked about yesterday to generate an alignment. On the other hand, you can also download the saved PyMol structure file or the, yeah, and that's a PSE file. And that's what we've got here. So aligned.pse. And, 
And again, this is showing you what the structures look like. Now notice proloisomerase pin 1 from humans, that's what's here in yellow, that has an extra domain. And so this, this uh, models that we're generating from this um, you know, bacterium doesn't have that extra domain, so that's something unique to humans. But you could look here at the, at the actual active site of the enzyme, which is right in here, and you can say, oh, look, there's quite a bit of structural similarity, at least in terms of the secondary structure, the helices and the strands. If I start showing sticks, so I'm going to show sticks from residues 140 to 180. Now, and it doesn't, it doesn't use those same residue numbering, so the models that it's giving us are, okay, well, let's show sticks. We'll do by res all. So we'll select by residue and we'll select everything within 15 angstroms of residues 140 to 180 and 1F8A. One so I'm basically taking residues 140 to 180 in PID1, so the original structure that we started with, and I'm going to select every other residue within 15 angstroms of that region. Oh, and it's called 1PIN. <laughs> That would help too. There we go. So now we can see what those amino acids look like. And if I compare the ITASER versus the FIRE2 result, you can see that even though they have similar secondary structures, there's some differences on the tertiary in the side chain conformations, right? So for example, this lysine sticks out straight here on one of the models and it goes and sort of curls back on another. And you can sort of use that to sort of make hypotheses. Is this an important residue? Is this not an important residue? So it's something that you can use in your own research. Since structure is so important, it gets you a handle on structure, even if you don't necessarily have a good solid uh, experimental crystal structure or an NMR structure to work with. OK, and that's it, right? So, so even though we lost quite a chunk of this session because of technical difficulties, uh, I think we, we're only seven minutes late. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so basically, what this is showing you is that you, know, you could use sequence alignment not only to find sequences that, that might be similar. I mean, that seems pretty simple. But you can actually do really complex and sophisticated you know, structural modeling using this concept of sequence alignment to generate new structures where you might not have otherwise had one. And so that's an extremely useful tool because sometimes generating a, a crystal structure is hard or even impossible to do. OK, so we wrapped up here. Any quick questions? So thanks for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. I appreciate it. I'm going to run upstairs and see if they have any progress on figuring out what's going on with this. Uh, and maybe we can move back to the next session.